You all know the top-hatted caricature of Honest Abe. Hell, in preparation for this video, I consumed no small number of primary sources suffused with praise that lapsed eagerly and often from fawning to disquietingly worshipful. Worshipful, you say? Of a man whose monument depicts him on a literal throne? Surely you jest. Which in and of itself, in a nation that created the office of president for the explicit purpose of forestalling such breathless pronouncements of kingly virtue in our leaders, should be alarming all on its own, but this video isn't meant to be merely corrective in nature. And as I intend to make clear fucking repeatedly, this is not open to interpretation. This ain't an agree to disagree situation, sunshine. Abraham Lincoln was America's first dictator, a lifelong and avowed advocate of centralized, authoritarian, top-down government, overseeing a nation whose government was repeatedly and explicitly described by its founders as being derived not from a federal government, but its member states, who in turn are enthralled to their citizenry. And if Andrew Jackson himself, something of an authoritarian, was the first of the non-founding father presidents, Lincoln represents a philosophical dividing line between the limited and enumerated federal powers of the original plural United States and the globalist goddamn empire we're suffering the adverse effects of at present. And that, I believe, more than anything, is the explanation for why Lincoln is the sacred cow to end all sacred cows. It's not about who he was, the war he fought, or even about him getting domed in a fucking theater for his trouble. It's about what he represents philosophically. Top down governance. To cut a novel into a novella, if Lincoln was wrong, so is our ruling class. And their every illegitimate edict will come tumbling after. Which is why it's so very unfortunate that he absolutely fucking was. Ah, but I can hear you already. Criticizing Lincoln? What are you, a lost causer? Chapter one fucking commenced. The Lost Cause may be the single most towering straw man ever erected. The idea that the Civil War was not principally waged over slavery, but was, like most any other war, primarily economic in nature, doesn't come from lost causers. It doesn't come from me. It comes from fucking Lincoln. Upon ascending to office in 1861 under the cloud of war, secession, and foreign interference, Lincoln stated outright what the most important objective of his administration was. Not bringing the South to heel, and certainly not freeing the blacks he'd repeatedly referred to as inferior up until that point. No. Are you ready for the great emancipator's primary preoccupation? Raising fucking tariffs. Quite contrary to the caricature of the South as rural bumpkin-topia and the North as the economic engine of the country, the reverse was true in the 1860s. Every time a conservative comes into contact with an obnoxious Californian and audibly incites God to carve that state off into the sea, socialismos of all hair colors inevitably fire back with some variant of most agriculture comes from California, or better still, the old chestnut, if California were its own country, it would have the sixth largest economy in the world. Well, if the southern United States of the 1860s had been allowed to peacefully secede in avoidance of a civil war, it would have boasted the fourth largest economy in the world. More than 70% of the world's tobacco and cotton crop at the time came from the South. And as high tariff Lincoln came to power with Thaddeus Stevens and the radical Republican Congress in tow, the Southern states who were primarily funding the government through skyrocketing tariffs had never been represented less. What's more, thanks to a slow takeover, many Southerners weren't feeling particularly well represented by their own majority party, the Democrats either. At the risk of becoming convoluted before I can dismantle the myth of a civil war over slavery, we need to tackle another omnipresent falsehood. The myth of the partisan flip. Stop me if you've heard this one before. It's some indeterminate, eternally ephemeral date. Sometimes the Civil War, sometimes the Civil Rights era. Hell, I've even heard Nixon. Republicans and Democrats 
pulled the old partisan switcheroo. Republicans had been central government status and suddenly switched to the party of personal responsibility and small government, while the minarchist Southern Democrats became the Progressive Party. The details of why this happened are left hazier than Ted Kennedy's memory on the night of July 18, 1969. But as I alluded in a prior video, America's homegrown political binary is the small government states' rights of Thomas Jefferson and the Democrats versus the status centralized pseudo monarchist government of Alexander Hamilton and later the Whigs, themselves not coincidentally named after an English political party. This is crucial to comprehending the political motives of Lincoln, who prior to being persuaded to forsake them for the ascendant Republican Party, had been a lifelong and avowed Whig. When considering the cause of a crime, in this case the Civil War, before you can begin to look for evidence, you need to look for patterns. Places the victim frequented, people that had motive or opportunity that they had a pattern of contact with. The problem with the narrative that the Civil War was caused by slavery is that a Civil War is a symptom, not a cause, an end result of a crisis of secession. When a state or several begin exploring or enacting articles of secession to separate themselves from the federal government, most defenders of the North and Lincoln then fall back to the position that the secession crisis was caused by slavery. But the problem with that is that it doesn't fit the pattern. There was a prior secession crisis that fell just short of the Civil War in 1828 when Henry Clay, Abraham Lincoln's self-professed political idol, passed the Tariff of Abominations, a sky-high tariff rate shoved through by Lincoln's previous party, the Whigs, placing a disproportionate financial burden upon the South, who accounted for over 70% of all exported goods and boasted the fourth largest economy in the world at the time, as we've already established. South Carolina held a special session of state Congress and voted to nullify the tariff, leading the nation to the precipice of outright secession. No mention of slavery, no moral grandstanding about abolition, particularly as Henry Clay himself had owned slaves. High tariffs followed by a secession crisis. Sort of like the exact same thing that preceded the secession crisis that sparked the American Civil War. And Henry Clay is an important figure to research if you want to understand the many lies about Lincoln, many of which he spun himself. Clay believed wholeheartedly in what he called the American system, originally generated by Alexander Hamilton. Speaker of the House, Henry Clay, fighting champion of American liberty. It lies within our power to create a system by which our institutions make us free. Let us become real and true Americans and build an American system that nothing shall ever destroy. <laughs> The American system essentially means government subsidies, a nationalized bank, and high taxes and tariffs. In short, mercantilism. It became the entire platform of the Whig Party, and Lincoln subscribed to and enacted every word of it. When they call Lincoln a liberator and freedom fighter, understand that these are the very lies Lincoln told at Henry Clay's funeral, at which he delivered a famous, highly politicized eulogy. And like Lincoln, Henry Clay was quoted numerous times, not only calling blacks inferior, but once he became Secretary of State, his statements on American Indians raised eyebrows even at that time. Lovely little bits like, he did not think them as a race worth preserving, unquote, or that their breed cannot be improved, or their disappearance from the human family will be no great loss to the world, unquote. When President Andrew Jackson fought and won in an attempt to dissolve the National Bank, it was Henry Clay who served as the primary antagonist. But historians rarely acknowledge that little Lincoln was riding in the sidecar there. Henry Clay and his apprentice, Abraham Lincoln, would excoriate Andrew Jackson as un-American, and Abe even echoed his mentor's calls for, quote, future vengeance against the American South. But he may have been in the throes of passion. After all, Lincoln loved his nationalized money supply. So much, in fact, that when the National Bank was killed by Jackson and states had to print money from their own treasuries, Lincoln adamantly opposed every attempt to audit it. And hey, you know what? All those people who crow about how we went off the gold standard thanks to Tricky Dick Nixon? Yeah, well, here's a funny story about Lincoln you're never likely to hear from a history professor. Lincoln's home state of Illinois had all the votes to pass a law requiring the Illinois State Bank to switch from paper to gold money. Democrats knew Lincoln and the Whigs were trying to avoid a vote they were guaranteed to lose, 
So they barred the doors. Lincoln and the Whigs jumped out the fucking window so they could keep printing paper money. Newspapers of the time lampooned Lincoln and his quote, flying Whigs. See also Howard Stern on a windy day. As episodes like this illustrate, the Whigs were in their death throes. Democratic country in the South, where the words of Jefferson still resounded through the halls of government, were understandably inhospitable to the Hamiltonian statist thought. And Whigs had no no hope of holding office below the Mason-Dixon line. And so Whigs made the same calculation as Southwestern Democrats when they transmogrified into Arizona rhinos in the 1980s and 90s. If you can't beat them, become them. Reformed Whigs turned Democrats soon arose to the highest stations of Southern power. Their focus on state subsidy of industry and the economy led them to be commercially interlocked with plantation owners. And it's likely for this reason that every one of the small handful of states which cited slavery as one but not all of the reasons for seceding just so happened to be in the hands of former Whigs turned Democrats. The Whig wing of the Democratic Party partly incited a civil war that they would later pin on the Jeffersonian Democrats during the post-war period. By entangling the valid arguments for secession proffered by Jeffersonian Democrats with the falsehoods perpetuated by former Whigs, not to mention the post-war Northern academics largely responsible for promulgating the lost cause myth, defenders of the dictator Lincoln have intertangled, vitiated, and discredited by default the very arguments that disproved their faulty hypothesis with a snarling scapegoat that was not in fact invented in the South. It was invented and espoused overwhelmingly overwhelmingly by Northern academics. Case in point, probably the most prominent exemplar of a lost causer in the 20th century was waspy Whig Democrat and all around shitbag du jour, Woodrow Wilson, who famously screened the birth of a nation at the White House. What was Woody Wilson prior to being president? A Jeffersonian sharecropper? Deep South croc wrangler, perhaps. Oh, that's right. He was a Northern academic. Hey, remind me again who, until only recently, the Public Policy Department at Princeton University was named after. It's a cute little bit of rhetorical Aikido, ain't it? But the lost cause is a lie all the same. I will not be falsely labeled a lost causer, particularly as the most vocal critics of Abraham Lincoln in the modern day generally hail from Rothbardian libertarian political circles, where a Using what of supporting something like slavery is just absurd enough to be mistaken for modern Marvel movie dialogue. Further, as if it even needs saying, even if it weren't a world-rending lie, the South don't need to be the good guys for Lincoln to be a piss-stinking tyrant. I'm not from the South. I have no sympathies with the Confederacy, save the perfectly valid grievances they had for desiring secession, such as disproportionate taxation, underrepresentation, and astronomically high tariffs. But I share those very same sympathies with the New England secessionists of 20 years previously. In short, if you're considering writing the words lost cause or in the comments section, consider more constructive activities like cartwheeling through traffic. Ah, but if the Civil War wasn't primarily about slavery, what about old Abe being the great Emancipator. where we get spicy. The accepted mainstream narrative surrounding the Emancipation Proclamation is without question the wildest propagandist fiction ever penned by political historians. One upping with ease all the most brazen Bolshevik reframes of the Cold War combined. To hear history teachers tell it, Lincoln, the lifelong atheist, laid hand to the Bible, unilaterally declared black men free, and so the shackles of untold thousands suddenly shattered in unison. The problem with this assertion is that the Emancipation Proclamation didn't free a single slave. Process that for a beat. Not one! And the reason why is simple and admitted by both Lincoln and his entire cabinet. It only applied to the South, rebel territory, which Lincoln did not at that point control. In fact, at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation's issuance, the Union didn't control a whole hell of a lot. The war was going poorly. Despite outnumbering their Confederate adversaries in most major engagements, the Civil War to that point could best be categorized as several months of occasional victories bracketed by a ceaseless deluge of double-dong defeat. And given Lincoln's legendary penchant for micromanaging the military, the 
failure was disproportionately his. And the foreign press were beginning to speculate that if he suffered another Fredericksburg-scale defeat, the Confederates may well have the opportunity to demand concessions or outright surrender. I say this to provide what your history professors most likely did not. Context. Issuing a proclamation freeing slaves in the growing number of territories Lincoln did not control is like the Pope declaring abortion cannot be banned by, say, the Mormon Church. Like, sure, that's neat, Francis, but we ain't exactly on the same Christmas card list here about something that actually affects the fucking most of us. More tellingly, the proclamation specifically stipulated that northern states which already held slaves got to keep them. And at least one state, West Virginia, was readmitted into the Union as a slave state. That would be surprising by itself for most, but even those long since red-pilled on Lincoln may not be aware that not only was the North exempted, but what few Confederate territories Lincoln was still barely hanging on to at the time were exempted as in by name, as in by fucking county, even troubling himself to specify the exact borders of the area Lincoln would very much like to continue keeping human beings in bondage. Those who have read the actual text of the proclamation will note that there's an entire section delineated which individual regions of Union-occupied Louisiana were explicitly fucking exempt. The Emancipation Proclamation, Emancipation, not included. And before you expectorate the age-old apologist chestnut, he was a man of his time, or that I'm applying contemporary critique to a man over a century dead and dusted, this was very much a prevailing view of Lincoln even in his own time. Major newspapers, both in America and abroad, chided it as toothless posturing, and Lincoln's own Secretary of State, William Seward, mocked his own boss and his proclamation in a private letter saying, quote, we show our sympathy with slavery by emancipating slaves where we cannot reach them and holding them in bondage where we could set them free. Unquote. But if it sounds like a limp law for chest puffing purposes, I assure you, it's infinitely more nefarious than that. As I mentioned, the North was losing the war badly, like 15 straight months of losses interrupted only by one minor victory and a single stalemate. Perhaps no battle better typifies the state of miserable desperation President Lincoln found himself in when the document was drafted than the aforementioned Battle of Fredericksburg. For eight hours on December 13th, 1862, the Union forces at Fredericksburg, under General Ambrose Burnside's command, had been decimated by Confederate General Robert E. Lee's troops. Ambrose Burnside was beside himself on the evening of the battle that uh, nothing had gone right from the outset. Nothing had even promised uh, the victory that he had hoped for where despite the Union outnumbering the Confederacy 121,000 to 80,000, the Union took more than two times the casualties and were forced into full retreat under cover of night. So when one member of the English press wrote that the Emancipation Proclamation was merely a matter of, quote, Lincoln playing his final card, no one understand they were A1 fucking right. But if it wasn't about freeing slaves in the South, because it didn't, and Lincoln explicitly forbade freeing slaves in areas held by the Union, what the hell was it supposed to accomplish? Oh, nothing much. Just government-mandated rape and murder. See, with the bulk of fighting men away, fighting for the Confederacy in the South, the plantation's daily management, for the most part, fell to female members of the family. Wives, in particular. See where I'm going with this? Lincoln wasn't declaring Southern slaves free. He was telling them to rise up and murder the primarily female managerial class of said plantations in the hopes that engineering a full-blown revolt would weaken economic production enough to give a much needed edge to the Union in a time when they were losing. It wasn't so much a Hail Mary as a call to murder and fucking deflower her. A London newspaper, The Spectator, put it as plainly as anyone ever has while hanging a bow on the true motivation of every act in Lincoln's authoritarian oeuvre. Quote, the principle is not that a human being cannot justly own another, but that he cannot own him if he is not loyal to the United States. The European press saw through it, and the few northern journalists Lincoln hadn't already arrested did too, but the cult of Lincoln have long since assured your history teacher 
never will. Look, if the Civil War was truly fought over slavery, no one would be more surprised than veterans of the Union. Not because I say so, but because when the Emancipation Proclamation dropped, they did! Over 200,000 Northern troops deserted in protest over the next few months with nearly as many draft dodgers. If the Civil War was fought over slavery, someone forgot to tell the Union Army. Northern soldiers took to calling it the Negro Proclamation, and the citizenry and newspapers in the North were no kinder. Far from achieving the intended effect, not only did Southern slaves not engage in mass revolt, the immediate aftermath saw a race riot erupt in New York City to protest the proclamation's issue issuance along with Lincoln's other unpopular law, conscription, which basically let Lincoln's wealthy political donors bribe their way out of compulsory military service. Do you like living in fear of the military draft? Be sure to thank Honest Abe for the privilege. Now, you contrast this with how Southern soldiers saw their role in why they were fighting. Comes up the question of what we Southern soldiers fought for. My friends, as a boy, I was 16 and a half years old. I didn't think about any of abolition of slavery. My mind wasn't developed enough to take in what the politicians had in mind. And hence, there was no trouble as to the freedom of the slaves. About half of the Negroes, of my father's Negroes, left and went to Norfolk to be under, as they considered, protection. But another half, 40, 50 of them, remained and cultivated the crops until after the war. The South did not fight for the preservation or extension of slavery. General Lee, as is well known, was making arrangements to free his Negroes, and his father-in-law had already drawn up a part of his will, free his Negroes. My friend, it was a great curse on this country that we had slavery, and I thank God that I did not bring up my boys and girls under a system of slavery under which I was brought under. What did you boys fight for then? Here's what great many people do not know. That as a young man that way I couldn't understand it fully. But I look back now and see my part in it and saw what we struggled for. And that was for states' rights. For states' rights. And as many of you know, immediately after the war, the rights of the various states, well, especially in the South, were very much curtailed, if I may use that word. To get back to that revolt, dwarfing the scale of the Summer of Love in January 6th, what do you figure Freedom Love and Lincoln's response was to what remains the largest civil disturbance in U.S. history? Send thousands of recently defeated Fredericksburg troops to fire on their own citizens in the streets of New York, murdering at least 300. Although over a century later, we're still unclear on the true scale of the fucking fatalities. Now, federal troops are available to put down the riots. Before dawn on Thursday, July 16th, two regiments of the New York National Guard returned to the city from Gettysburg. Thousands more troops will follow over the next few days. Dozens of innocent civilians have been killed as well as soldiers and policemen. But no one knows how many rioters have fallen in the street battles. Families who found themselves confronted with the realization that members of their own family had been involved uh, proceeded to take the bodies, bury them in the backyard, and uh, one of the most striking things about the aftermath was the astonishing number of bodies that were found floating in the rivers. Have I reminded you lately that the military is not your friend? Not that it wasn't without provocation. This was somewhat of a heel program. And while it would be easy to paint the population as the leering racist bad guys for the lynchings and looting to follow, understand that Lincoln expressed the same sentiments both before and after the election. The draft riots were, in essence, a series of anti-black and anti-republican crimes perpetrated by an army of many Lincolns. The North was Lincoln, having not received a single electoral vote outside of it. And thus it cannot be stressed enough that the North 
hated black people. In Lincoln's home state of Illinois, thanks to a series of discriminatory edicts, blacks weren't even legally allowed to live there. And many of those laws were passed when Lincoln was a state congressman and he voted for every single fucking one. French writer, poet, and legend of political science Alexis de Tocqueville wrote after his travels as a diplomat in America that he believed slavery was far more brutal in the North than in the South. A not at all uncommon opinion among observers from Europe, might I add. Now, as the Civil War raged, European powers who had long ago ended slavery peacefully began to worry about trading with a slave state. So they dispatched envoys to assess the violent nature of slavery stateside. Every single one determined slavery was a more brutal practice by far in the North than it was in the South, with none other than New Jersey singled out as the worst place in the world to live as a slave. And Lincoln embodied all of it. Hell, Abraham Lincoln's father, Thomas, worked as a fucking slave catcher, which perhaps brings into focus quotes such as the following. Quote, I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and black races. There is a physical difference between the two, which in my judgment will probably forever forbid their living together upon the footing of equality. And inasmuch as it becomes a necessity that there be a difference, I, as well as Judge Douglas, am in favor of the race to which I belong, having the superior position. I have never said anything to the contrary. Un fucking quote. And lest you argue that that was ancient ass history by the time of the Civil War, that quote is from the 1858 senatorial debate in Ottawa, Illinois, just a couple years before Lincoln was stinking up the White House. It's often alleged by Lincoln's increasingly irrational defense force that to believe Lincoln was a supporter of slavery, you have to cherry pick quotes. But truth is, when you dig into his personal and political history, you have to cherry pick the fuck around them to arrive at any other viable conclusion. Prior to the war, Abraham Lincoln supported the Corwin Amendment, an alteration of the Constitution that would have made the institution of slavery permanent and inviolable per the founding document of the country. With the full support of a Republican Congress, this amendment had every vote required to pass with ease. The South, nevertheless, seceded almost as if the Civil War wasn't primarily about slavery or something. Lincoln's opposition to freeing slaves was demonstrated numerous times, not only in the Senate, but during his own presidency. In 1861, Union General John Fremont, while waging a war against a guerrilla force in Missouri, enacted martial law, which as a matter of pure routine and other such instances to that point, afforded the Union Army the right of expropriation of Confederate property. That means legal looting. Fremont drafted what is, in essence, a forerunner of the Emancipation Proclamation. And he did so mere months before Lincoln himself drafted the very same document. Not out of any antipathy toward slavery, mind you, but because in the North, as in the South, slaves were lumped in with an estate. As economist Thomas Sowell once pointed out, slaves were taken as part of a plantation property itself. Itself. Hence why Thomas Jefferson, who wanted to free his slaves, was only able to free around nine of them at tremendous personal cost. Because if your plantation was in debt, and Jefferson's absolutely was, you technically didn't own your own property, and thus you could not legally free your slaves. Only your lender at the bank could do that. General John Fremont had to free the Missouri slaves to pave the way for stealing their property. Contrary to the cultists who will argue Fremont overstepped his authority, this had been done a half dozen times in only the year leading up to this occurrence. What makes this encounter unique is that not only did Lincoln specifically demand the provision that liberated slaves be removed, he removed Fremont from fucking command. In fact, it was in response to criticism over this very act from his own side that Lincoln was compelled to write a letter addressing it to the New York Tribune's Horace Greeley, from which emerged the fabled quote you'll often see fallaciously cited by leering Lincolnites waxing pragmatic about how it was all just really to preserve the Union. And I quote, if I could preserve the Union without freeing a single slave, I would do it, unquote. That the 
union was already dissolved by Lincoln when he made it effectively involuntary under penalty of arrest, deportation, or death, failed to make the fucking article. Ironically, this oft-cited quote is an explicit contradiction of Lincoln's myriad prior statements, which asserted that the president has no constitutional authority to act on the issue of slavery. Meaning that essentially, with this single newspaper quote, Lincoln just publicly declared himself dictator. Be sure to mention that when the everything he did was to preserve the union, yea, who's dust this dog shit quote off and shove it in your face is some manner of facile counter argument. It's like if someone asked you for evidence Hitler really dug the shit out of Jews so you hand him a copy of Mein Kampf. And speaking of dictators. When it comes right down to nut cutting, truth of the matter is, Abraham Lincoln was America's very first dictator. Many such mongoloids in academia make the more elevated argument that he was like a benevolent king, which frankly is a spin so charitable it ought to be fucking tax exempt. Under the Magna Carta, the king or queen of England could suspend habeas corpus, meaning the requirement to be told what you're being charged with and provided with legal counsel only through an act of parliament. The many mean monkeys who giddily tongue Abe's top hat bedeck balls will often enjoin that James Madison himself suspended habeas corpus, to which I respond with a full-throated bull fucking shit he did. During the War of 1812, habeas corpus was indeed suspended for a specified duration when and only when Congress voted for it. The only thing James Madison did was not fucking veto it, even upon the urging of the more statist inclined that he do so unilaterally and immediately. He went out of his way to specifically declaim the authority to do so. Lincoln, meanwhile, knew better than the father of the Constitution. He circumvented Congress entirely and suspended habeas corpus his own damn self, then set upon the enterprise of deporting his political enemies in the North or jailing them for infractions as minor as neglecting to include a prayer for Abraham Lincoln at the beginning of a public church service. As no shit, the Lincoln administration required by what they construed as law for the duration of his despotic administration. Folks, Lincoln wasn't a king. Whatever the literally sitting on a fucking throne Lincoln monument might suggest, let alone the post-death portrait commissioned by Congress portraying an angelic Abraham Lincoln ascending to heaven flanked by fucking cherubs on the taxpayer's dime. Folks at the time understand this. Lincoln had more power than any king and a greater tendency by far for authoritarianism. Secretary of State William Seward would later be heard bragging to British diplomats that he had more authority to jail his enemies than the queen herself. Sadly, only European papers had the pendulous balls to publish that quote. No one put it more plainly than Ohio Congressman Clement L. Vallandigham, who in famous reply to Abraham Lincoln's State of the Union address enjoined that Abraham Lincoln's assumption of illusory war powers was, quote, a dangerous violation of the Constitution, which this civil war is professedly waged to support, and that declaring war without a congressional vote was, quote, the kind of dictatorial act which would have cost any English sovereign his head at any time within the last 200 years, unquote. Abraham Lincoln disproved both these assertions by having General Burnside march troops to his front doorstep and deport him to Canada for the crime of criticism. I should add that most of his speech was devoted to criticizing Lincoln's tax policy. He wasn't deporting traitors. He was deporting and arresting political opponents. But assuming acolytes of the Lincoln cult even acknowledged Lincoln was a dictator at all, they inevitably argue the top-headed titwank had ample logical justification to assume dictator powers. In short, it were war and he inherited it. Two problems with that. One, Lincoln inherited a secession crisis. He created a fucking war. And two, point me to the provision in the Constitution that allows for fucking wartime presidential powers at all. I'll wait. 
The problem with exculpating Abe's autocracy on the basis that he had wartime presidential powers is that wartime presidential powers were a fiction fucking invented by Abraham Lincoln. Congress, not the commander in chief, may assume or confer wartime powers in the event of emergency. James Madison never invoked war powers when New England refused to participate in the War of 1812, effectively seceding from their official obligations in that conflict. Yet, wonder of wonders, Honest Abe found him just a lying around through a barkingly batshit interpretation of the Constitution that construes the president's duty to, quote, take care that laws be faithfully executed, with the president becoming the law, lest his subjects be faithfully executed. Lincoln doesn't have the it was war defense because it wasn't one until his actions upon assuming the office, and he doesn't have a wartime powers defense on account of he fucking invented them. Lincoln felt he knew better what the founders meant than even the fucking founders did. Assuming his non-existent emergency powers unilaterally and without consent of Congress, secure in the knowledge that the radical Republicans under perhaps the only man more authoritarian than himself, Thaddeus Stevens would cover his bony ass. And oh, did they ever. Months after the fact, Abraham Lincoln already having ascended to downright dictatorship, Stevens convened a session of the Senate to finally vote whether to grant him the emergency powers he was already abusing. Opening by stating that as Abraham Lincoln had already invoked those powers without their permission, the motion to grant them would therefore be assumed to have passed, then immediately adjourned the session and sneered as political opponents of the act, who may well have outnumbered the yay votes, might I add, made passionate but impotent pleas excoriating Abraham Lincoln and his political pawns for violating the Constitution. And I doubt very much if Thaddeus Stevens and the radical Republicans feared for their safety, as he was no doubt aware of the Secretary of State's new secret police. You heard that correct who were well-armed and within earshot should the protests turn violent. And speaking of which, anyone who knows anything about Alaska will doubtless have a more than passing familiarity with William Seward. But long before he was spending way too much of our money acquiring Canada's mini-fridge in Alaska, Seward launched a faltering bid to secure the Republican nomination, which Lincoln would later inhabit, spawning the conciliatory gesture of making Seward his Secretary of State. Even a middling student of history likely knows all that. What most do not is that Seward was also the fucking Himmler of the Lincoln cabinet. After Lincoln's unilateral assertion that he possessed emergency powers enumerated precisely fucking nowhere in the Constitution, and with pro-secession sentiment reaching a fever pitch in the North, given the tight business ties between New York entrepreneurs and their trading partners in the South, Seward set out forming a secret police whose stated goal was to suss out, and I quote, disloyalty. But functionally speaking, they were professional quashers of dissent. Period. Praise Jefferson Davis. Better hope your Republican neighbor didn't overhear. With habeas corpus suspended, you can and will be arrested without trial. And many, many were. We all know about the Southern Secession, but there was very nearly a central confederacy to go along with it, largely comprised of non-slaveholding border states such as Maryland, who sympathized with Southern grievances like the abrogation of the right of secession and excessive tariffs and taxation. So aggrieved were the residents of Maryland that the state legislature began holding debates on the merits of seceding themselves. Lincoln flipped his fucking shit. The legislature acceded to his wishes and publicly declared they would not be voting on secession. Only for totally not a dictator Abraham Lincoln to arrest the entire state legislature of the state of Maryland all the same, those who didn't fucking flee anyway. A Maryland judge determined the president was not within his constitutional authority to do any of the above, a judgment which Lincoln elected to leave on red and did it anyway. The local press pitched a fucking fit, with one editorialist penning a scathing indictment in the pages of the Baltimore Exchange, deploring the president for his autocratic proclivity. He was immediately imprisoned, and he was in good company. Over the coming year, an estimated 13,000 political opponents and journalist critics in the North would be arrested without charge or affordance of trial. That editorialist name? Francis Key Howard, grandson of American icon Francis Scott Key, the lawyer and poet who famously authored The Star-Spangled Banner while witnessing the English assault on none other than Fort McHenry.
the very same fort that his grandson and thousands of others were now held in without charge or legal counsel for months on end, all for the crime of criticizing the president in print. Honest Abe, ladies and gentlemen. Incidentally, Howard's incarceration were provide the subject for the book 14 Months in American Bastilles, which despite the unceasing suck fest for Abraham Lincoln in years since, somehow managed to be housed in the Library of Congress presumably when less totalitarian heads later prevailed. But for the time being, the crackdown had begun. The anti-Fuhrer Fuhrer reached such white-hot pitch in the state of Maryland that an anti-Lincoln third party hit the ballots hard. And in the event you're still reeling from our more recent forays into electoral fortification, you may be interested to note that Seward, under direct orders from Abraham Lincoln, had all opposition party ballots color-coded so that they could be taken to a... <clears throat> neutral location and presumably fucking burned. And that's if they even got a goddamn vote as Honest Abe ordered the government to print posters urging all citizens to point out peace party activists to Seward's secret police. And thus an appalling number of Baltimore citizens were arrested while carrying the wrong color ballot. The official charge you inquire? And I quote, polluting the ballot box. And you thought Baltimore was corrupt on the fucking wire. In the time of Lincoln, long before the internet or fucking phones, there were two primary methods of communicating information, newspapers and the telegraph. Abraham Lincoln censored them both. And we're not talking, oh, an intercept here, a false message there. I'm talking full bore. Lincoln made a list of over a hundred newspapers in the North that had been critical of himself and then ordered the postmaster general to refuse him fucking mail service. New York papers in particular were singled out in censorious fashion. The New York Daily News owned by Ben Wood, brother of Fernando Wood, then mayor of New York City, himself an incisive critic of old age elected to apply some Aikido to the problem. He paid for private couriers and delivery services to dispense his paper to each and every customer on the route. Lincoln ordered federal marshals to arrest them. The paper went out of business within six fucking months. By late 1861, virtually every one of the hundreds of newspapers all across the country critical of Lincoln had been shuttered or silenced, even at the times with the aid of military force. And whatever newspapers could not be cowed with threats or outright imprisoned due to personal or political connections, unknown mobs of ransackers who looked an awful lot like William Seward's secret police with potato sacks on their skulls simply broke the fuck in and pulverized their printing press with sledgehammers and pickaxes. Hell, sometimes they didn't even trouble to disguise themselves. When the Democratic Standard in Washington, D.C. dared discuss Abraham Lincoln's micromanagement and military blunders during the first Battle of Manassas, uniformed military barged the fuck in the front door and set fire to the building during working hours. Something you have to understand about the Civil War is that it did not go well for the Union initially. And as fatality figures went from rough to awful to biblically but fucking bad, the so-called Peace Party became ever more vocal in the North. Crucially, most of the censorship described in this video occurred long the fuck before that. Contrary to the cunts who allege Abraham was a man made for his time, a humble individual turned tyrant in response to events beyond his ken, the historical record is transparently clear. This was an authoritarian in waiting, ever vigilant for a sufficient excuse to honor the rigors of his repugnant programming. His earliest political statements stretching back to the 18 fucking 40s assert the need for central planning and the strong arm of authoritarian government. Hell, in his introductory speech upon achieving his first ever political office, Lincoln said, quote, I am humble Abraham Lincoln. My politics are short and sweet like the old woman's dance. I am in favor of a national bank, in favor of the internal improvement system, see business bailouts and mercantilism, and a high protective tariff, unquote. The Civil War did not make him that way. Abraham Lincoln helped make the Civil War. Stop 
fucking praising him for it or you'll keep getting more of the same. Under circumstances such as these, it's remarkable there were any more northern newspapers willing to criticize the president at all. The fact that there were hundreds speaks to the deep and abiding resentment of Lincoln's dictatorial behavior even under threat of destitution, execution, or imprisonment. If you are a defender of Abraham Lincoln's assumption of dictatorial powers to preserve the union, there is one inexplicable and indefensible fact that simply will not die. If Abraham Lincoln's cause was ending slavery rather than preserving a territorial and taxation monopoly, then why, with all the powers at his disposal, did he never use one of them to force manumission or compensated emancipation of slaves? The two policies that worked in Europe two decades before the American Civil War was even a distant danger. If he had the dictatorial power to raise an army with a draft, jail journalists, shutter newspapers, arrest judges, and deport his political adversaries, he had the power to force through the same policy that freed slaves in under six years in England and did so without firing a fucking shot. And there's only one answer. He didn't want to free slaves. And saving the Union was the code word he used interchangeably to obfuscate his true agenda, the accretion of centralized government power. And only a war against his own citizens could perform that feat. What occurred in America is not at all unique. While Europe ended slavery peacefully by buying out slave owners, some countries instead used abolition, even after opposing it, just as Lincoln did, as a convenient method of organizing resistance to seize the levers of power. Nations like Colombia, Venezuela, not the coziest of company, I'd add, but it's a greater insult to the countries in question, frankly. The bloodshed and Venezuela and Colombia's anti-slavery uprisings, which likewise expanded state power inexorably thereafter, never for a moment rose to the level Lincoln prescribed. He alone was willing to war with half his country. And yet, that's Lincoln's only company. Aspiring tin pot authoritarians from Central and South America who use slavery as a cudgel to crumple their constitution and enact their own statist vision. Welcome home, Honest Abe. To even begin to entertain the fiction that Lincoln was a liberator in private and a despot in public only for the benefit of exigency or public sentiment, you not only have to dismiss decades of public and private statements, not to mention presidential actions, which repeatedly contradict that imaginary aim, but much more tellingly, you have to willfully ignore the only consistent position of Abraham Lincoln's life, his complete, undeviating dedication to subjugating the American people to the centralizing hand of the federal government. It's the only thing in his entire career he's consistent about, and it's the one thing Lincoln's army of apologists refused to even momentarily consider. Maybe Lincoln did didn't wage war with half the country so he could free slaves he expressed public contempt for while European powers did so peacefully. Maybe he didn't lock up opposition journalists because it was wartime and he had a union to save. Maybe, just maybe, he did it to employ the same remedy he prescribed for every other ill afflicting America, unbridled, abject authoritarianism. Was Abraham Lincoln a dictator? Put it this way. Benito Mussolini's black shirts would pluck a page from Honest Abe and do the exact same thing to their most visible journalist critics in their ascent to power. And I don't know many who contend old Benny Spaghetti weren't a fucking dictator. Now, there'll doubtless be sneering and midwit mockery about how I wish Trump had done that, but this wasn't the modern corporate press, you half-smart simps. These were homegrown local papers. This was less like Trump calling the New York Times his bluff, and much more like Biden strong-arming social media to silence his critics using the FBI as a bludgeon. Newspapers being, after all, the social media of their era. Careful what you wish the fuck for, you might already have it. The black heart of the Civil War holds an even more darksome truth by far. As I've previously intimated, not only was it not waged to end the enterprise of slavery, it was arguably only peripherally waged 
even to preserve the territorial and tax monopoly they held during a time of financial crisis in the North. Look, in a central philosophical context, the real reason the Civil War was waged was to end the heretofore universally acknowledged right of secession, something Lincoln's most ardent defenders are inevitably forced to argue does not exist in order to absolve their neck-bearded Buddha of culpability. The union, they argue, was voluntary to join, sure, but inviolable once entered into. And thus, all the tyranny, all the unjustified jailings, the establishment of a secret police, indeed the civil war itself, is all permissible under the proviso that he did it all to save the Union. This despite three separate states reserving the right to secede when they joined, including at least one, Virginia, who had that written into their state's declarative document. The Union of the Founding Fathers was voluntary. Lincoln didn't save that Union. He fucking murdered it. And then he turned it into a Soviet one. Though that's actually a bit of an insult to the Soviets, seeing as on at least one occasion, they actually allowed states to secede without fucking murdering them. If we accord with Lincoln's interpretation of the Union as voluntary and immutable once enjoined, then the New England secessionists refusing to send men in arms to fight during the War of 1812 would have qualified as sedition. Yet as we've already established, James Madison, president at the time, and I'd remind you, father of the Constitution, specifically refused used his right to suspend habeas corpus without an act of Congress, and most importantly, did not raise the largest standing army ever seen in human history to that point and proceed to murder half a million of his countrymen with it. And really, the reasons for secession are immaterial. South, East, West, or Northeast, all of them could have seceded, citing any reason whatsoever, from a steady train of abuses and usurpations to the inborn desire to erect a utopia for baby blue fucking Smurfs and still be in the constitutional right. As a great American president once said, quote, any people, anywhere, being inclined and having the power, have the right to rise up and shake off the existing government and form a new one that suits them better. This is a most valuable, a most sacred right, a right which we hope and believe is to liberate the world. Nor is this right confined to cases in which the whole people of an existing government may choose to exercise it. Any portion of such people that can, may revolutionize and make their own of so much of the territory as they inhabit, as said on January 12th, 1848 by Jefferson... D oh shit, that was Abraham fucking Lincoln, wasn't it? Lest you believe that was a one-off, Old Abe himself later appeared to reverse position on the subject of secession when he helped set up a Republican puppet state in the western half of Virginia in 1864 and incite them to what? Secede! Unfortunately for him, it was also unconstitutional as the federal government has no constitutional authority to simply make a seceding state. Governments are explicitly defined as being created by the people within said region. His own Attorney General, Edward Bates, said as much. In fact, much of the more vivid accounts of Abraham Lincoln's tyranny comes not from some imaginary Southern straw man shrieking lost cause slogans across the cotton fields, but from people in Abe's own administration. In fact, if one goes categorically through the Declaration of Independence to the so-called train of abuses Jefferson and the Funky Bunch claim they'd suffered under English occupation, well, Let's just say the slightest of patterns emerges. Point number one, King George abolished their representation and installed English minders, effectively regional dictators to oversee incompliant colonies. Sort of kind of like the martial law conquered Southern territories labored under or the outright military dictatorships that ruled over the Southern United States for another old 12 titty fucking years after the Civil War. Point number two, the King of England leaned on or removed judges until they complied with his his political will. You know, like when Lincoln arrested a federal judge for criticizing his assumption of imaginary dictator powers while suspending habeas corpus. Point number three, the King of England created new bureaucratic offices from whole cloth while sending, quote, swarms of officers to harass the people and eat their sustenance. Like, go. Oh, Abraham Lincoln's bureaucratic hydra that oversaw Southern affairs even long after his death. And as for swarms of soldiers, would you consider, say, a secret police that at one point was ordered to fire upon and murder hundreds of New York protesters during the draft riots to be it all swarm-like? What about General Benjamin Butler, who ordered that, quote, any Southern woman failing to show the proper respect to Union soldiers would be regarded as a prostitute 
and treated like one. Gorsh, but I wonder what he meant by that. I mean, you could go point by point down the declaration, keeping armies among the people. Well, if by keeping you mean arresting and fucking killing, then sure, rendering the military independent of the citizenry. <laughs> well, Lincoln sure as shit instituted the draft, didn't he? Soldiers quartering among us, cutting off all trade, imposing taxes without consent, point by ass pounding, point. Every crime the founders ascribed to the English and King George the more rightly credited to Parliament, who at that point were far from Funkadelic, can just as readily, in some cases even more obviously, be ascribed to Abraham Lincoln. And here's the kicker. Most of that train of abuses occurred before the fucking war. If the Civil War was treason, so the fuck was the American Revolution. Not because lost causers say so, because the goddamn Declaration does. Oh, and Thomas Jefferson, the author of said document, his grandson, Thomas Garland Jefferson, fought for the Confederacy and died at the Battle of Newmarket. Now, I assured all of you, this wouldn't be a video about the Civil War. And look, I won't. But there are two chapters of such that simply must be discussed to truly comprehend the demoniac nature of the despot in question, its incitement and its conclusion. As I said previously, the problem with alleging Lincoln's every act was justified on the basis that he was facing treason and civil war is that he didn't inherit a civil war, he inherited a secession crisis. Abraham Lincoln helped engineer a civil war. Whatever your feelings on the outbreak of the civil war or its inciting event, the siege of Fort Sumter, allow me to reiterate, the South do not need to be the good guys for Lincoln to be bad. The South had seceded, and at least until that point, had done so without firing a shot. The Union maintained military bases in the South in explicit defiance of this fact. I would remind you all that we warred with England twice over this very same behavior. Lincoln nevertheless assured all that it was not an act of Northern aggression, and to underscore his point, he vacated several military bases throughout the South when pressed to do so. A Confederate Peace Commission were dispatched to secure a separate peace. Lincoln ignored them. French diplomat and poet Alexis de Tocqueville offered to independently arbitrate a peace between the parties. He was rebuffed by Lincoln. For weeks upon weeks, as tensions mount and the local populations complain of being ransacked by Union looters, Lincoln assures everyone in the media he intends to cede Fort Sumter to the South. And then he reinforces it with an armed military escort in tow who for some bizarre reason have explicit orders not to fire even if fired upon, almost as if he expects it. Just aggressive enough to provoke retaliation, but not aggressive enough to appear the architect of the Civil War. See what's happening here? Because outside observers from Europe and elsewhere certainly did. Hell, even local papers, as the Providence Daily Post put it, quote, Mr. Lincoln told newspapers for three weeks that Sumter was to be abandoned. Now Mr. Lincoln has found a way to author a civil war without appearing its aggressor. Unquote. Lincoln wanted a war, desperately. Not because your lost cause straw man says so. Not because I say so. But because after the first shots were fired, fucking Lincoln said so. In a letter to Union Naval Commander Gustavus Fox dated May 1st, 1861, just weeks after the Sumter bombardment, which resulted in zero fatalities, might I add, Honest Abe would write, quote, you and I both anticipated that the cause of the country would be advanced by making the attempt to provision Fort Sumter, even if it should fail. And it is no small consolation now to feel that our anticipation is justified by the results." Unquote. See, what I deliberately didn't mention earlier on is that Lincoln was warned not just by the South, but by his own generals that reprovisioning Fort Sumter would be an act of war. Lincoln not only did so, he sent along an armed battleship escort just so the South didn't misinterpret his provocative intention, after promising repeatedly he would not, including once mere hours before the event. Gustavus Fox himself would later recall that it seemed important to Lincoln 
Republican to, quote, show the South as having fired upon bread. The War of 1812 was waged because the T-Swill and fucking Redcoats wouldn't vacate their military bases in American territory. Why would Lincoln make and reinforce a military base in Southern territory with an armed naval escort when he'd vacated numerous Southern bases already by that point be taken as anything other than a provocation? Lincoln's own secretaries, John Nikolai and John Hay, admitted not only had Lincoln maneuvered the South into a situation where they would basically have to be the first to fire, but that it was, quote, important that the rebellion be put in the wrong in the process, unquote. This, of course, contradicts Lincoln's own words before Congress later when he claimed he acted without guile in reinforcing Fort Sumter. You couldn't have acted with more guile if you hurled a fucking sonic boom at the fort, you black-eyed bitch-made sociopath. But I'll not hear anyone called a sociopath in William Tecumseh Sherman's company. A rare instance where even the status circle jerk of mainstream historians inevitably fail to mollify Lincoln's murderous legacy. General Sherman's march to the sea is called an atrocity even by academia, but the truth is, it's an ongoing series of atrocities. And if the court historians of the cult of Abraham assert that the Civil War was waged to help blacks and end slavery, someone forgot to tell General Sherman. For his host burned lynched and raped at least as many blacks as whites to the point that only recently liberated slaves in many southern towns turned on their union liberators and engaged in open guerrilla fighting on the confederacy's behalf uh, sherman was quoted once as saying that he believed that uh, slavery was good for black people so we, we know that he was he was no liberal which will tend to happen given lovely episodes like having a noose slung around your neck until you tell Sherman where Confederate bases are located or being held down and forced to watch as your wife and daughter are raped by the same Union soldiers that just turned your town into a parking lot. When a long line of liberated slaves began to follow on the heels of Sherman's army, presuming they'd be born to freedom in the fucking North or some shit, he enslaved them a second time instead, enlisting them as unpaid servants for his fucking officers. Don't worry, though. Upon crossing a major river by boat, he made sure to keep his troop boats on the other side of the river, never sending them back across, and thus ensuring the liberated slaves were stranded without a roof, clothes, or fucking food. But a large group of runaway slaves, perhaps more than a thousand, were following behind and slowing down the march. After crossing the creek, the soldiers pulled up the pontoon bridge, leaving the slaves stranded on the other side. With Confederate cavalry closing in, many of them jumped into the creek. It's estimated that hundreds of them, unable to swim, drowned. At the risk of greatly softening the impact of this ghoul's military excursions, I'll only summarize the gory goddamn details. From the raising of Shenandoah to the burning of Columbia and Atlanta, simply saying these names at events out loud I find robs them of their true import. Many modern historians dismiss these events as mere angry northern troops losing discipline and looting, but the truth of the matter is that looting, pillage, arson, and rape were a well-ordered business under General Sherman. There were specialized squads who often immediately after Sherman assured the local population all property would be unmolested would then arrive armed with crowbars, axes, and hammers with a full kit of arson paraphernalia in tow and then proceed to level entire towns, stopping immediately and leaving in utterly orderly fashion once they'd concluded. These were not isolated incidents. This was linked Lincoln's conception of warfare as enacted by General Sherman. Take a trip through the Deep South sometime. You'll periodically pass a stone marker here or there, often with an accompanying plaque describing a settlement that existed up until Sherman's march. The TV western Hell on Wheels features a traumatized southern protagonist who hails from Meridian, Mississippi, a city that ceased to exist after Sherman's march to the sea. Not according to me, according to Sherman. Meridian, with its depots, storehouses, arsenal, hospitals, offices, hotels, and cantonments, no longer exists, he stated, as a city still smoldered behind him. I was with General Sherman on his march south. What we did. Evil, unspeakable things. The only way to cast out the devil is to confess to God. No. No, I can't. 
Tell me about Meridian. How do you know about Meridian? The thousands dead, robbed, and raped might have been considered fortunate as the remaining citizens were ordered at gunpoint to vacate the city with winter rapidly approaching. There were injuries on both sides and southern looting happened more than once, but the Confederacy never boasted anything approaching this level of administration-endorsed institutional genocide. Lest we mistake Sherman's intent, in a private letter to his wife, he would describe the purpose of his campaign as, quote, extermination, not of soldiers alone, that is the least of the trouble, but of the people, unquote, to which his wonderful wife, Eleanor Ewing, would express arousal at the prospect of the war being one of, quote, extermination, and that all Southerners should be driven like swine into the sea. May we carry fire and sword into their states until not one habitation is left standing. What soaring prose! Long may she rot. And if Abraham Lincoln was celebrated for his unprecedented micromanagement of the Civil War, and indeed he is, then the cult of Lincoln's feeble attempt to allege that these were isolated incidents of which he was utterly oblivious and never once ordered, approached the order of outright barking lunacy. In preparing for this presentation, I consumed a litany of sources, from favorable, fluffy accounts of Lincoln the Liberator to lost cause agitprop pronouncing him a demon made flesh. I'm here to tell you nothing I read about Lincoln or the Civil War turned my stomach like William Tecumseh Sherman's personal collected memoirs. Unless you still stubbornly cling to the facile ahistorical belief that Lincoln was unaware of and never once personally ordered or endorsed the war crimes of General Sherman, this despite the fact that he left Washington to personally meet with such no less than 11 times and often slept in the telegraph office in Washington to correspond more quickly with his general it's the words of Sherman himself that will disabuse you of that delusion. In his memoirs, Sherman describes a gathering of Lincoln and his victorious generals convened in March of 1865, a mere month from the demoniac in question catching the most deserved bullet in history, wherein he describes Lincoln as requesting a detailed account of his march to the sea and that Lincoln, quote, particularly enjoyed hearing stories of the activities of his, quote, bummers. Bummers being the cutesy fucking name Sherman gave to his trained squads of arsonists, looters, and rapists whose task it was to level entire southern cities to the ground. And far from doing it all to preserve the Union, as I believe I've already established, he quite clearly fucking destroyed it. Put it this way. If you're an American and someone asks what country you're in, what do you say? The United States. Singular. You don't say Louisiana, one of the United States. Prior to the Civil War, United States was plural. The proof that the authoritarians won in the Civil War was actually about ending the right of secession is in every sentence you have ever uttered that involved the United States of America. And most motherfuckers never notice. That's why this video exists. Because it isn't just about Lincoln. It's about the merits of self-determinism, one of the founding principles upon which we were formed, and the fact that we all but worship the man who participated in, if not engineered, an entire war just to end that right definitively. Having spent his entire political career prior to that point explicitly saying he wished to do so. And yet a flock of fuckheads all around the world still insist he did it all for a principle he never held. The freedom of his fellow man. Something no U.S. president in history has done more to abrogate at once. I'd say it blows my mind, but no one's mind was more blown in the end than his. I'm Six Semper Tyrannus Fist. God fucking speed. Won't miss this time. Oh no! He's gonna blast President Lincoln! <laughs> I knew you'd risk yourself for Mr. Lincoln.